It's time for Econ! <laughs> okay, that was maybe too much, but here we are. Let's talk about chapter 14, Oligopoly. What is oligopoly? Why does it develop? And why do we study this differently than monopolistic competition and perfect competition? So we're going to define what oligopoly is, and we're going to kind of identify why this market structure is a little bit unique compared to the others. And then, based on that, we will do a bit of a primer on game theory. Um, I am a game theorist, and so I might do game theory a touch heavier than some of the other professors, but it's how we generally study oligopoly in practice, and it is a fantastic set of tools to study any strategic situation um, in the world. So let's get going. Oligopoly is a market structure with a very small number of firms, as few as two. If we have um, just two firms, we would call that a duopoly. So three firms would be a triopoly and so on. Um, but oligopoly just means a market structure with a few or small number of companies in it. The most important and distinctive feature of the oligopoly is that it has large, significant, and sustained barriers to entry. Uh, alternatively, we could put that as ease of entry is low. That means is if you want to join this market as an individual who's outside of the market currently, it is going to be extremely difficult for you to break in and to be a significant player in this market. Um, that's the most important feature, and that's why the number of firms is going to be so small. Um, further, the type of product here can be identical or differentiated. When it came to perfect competition, we needed to have identical products. Monopolistic competition had differentiated products. But here, it doesn't matter. It could be both, it could be either. It depends on the particular oligopoly uh, that we're talking about. So what really defines the oligopoly is these barriers to entry that makes it so there's only a couple of companies. We call a firm operating in this market structure an oligopolist. It's a fun word to say, try it. And if someone is behaving in a manner befitting this market, we say they're acting oligopolistically. I think that's pretty fun too. All right, so here is our uh, chart that we've been working our way through. We've stepped through uh, perfect competition and monopolistic competition. And now we are going to examine and learn all about oligopoly. So again, this tells you that there are a few number of firms with identical or differentiated products that that ease of entry is very low, um, that the barriers to entry are very high and significant. A couple of examples just to get us thinking are media, car companies, breakfast cereals. Right? How many main companies sell breakfast cereals? Three. How many car companies can the average American family afford? When um, the bottom 90% of households, the average income is $31,000 a year, how many companies can they really buy from? Eight, ten, maybe? It's a small number of firms. In American media, it's only a handful. Like looking at one hand for all of our major media outlets. So these are going to be some examples of oligopoly. So the first place to start um, in examining oligopolies once you know what they are is to figure out if you have one. So uh, we as economists um, in academics and in government uh, use a couple of different metrics to determine if we've got an oligopoly. One of those is uh, called the four firm index. And that is if four, the four biggest firms in the market have 40% or more market share. Market share is just the percentage of revenue that your firm is responsible for. So if your market share is you know, 2%, that means your company uh, is responsible for 2% of the revenue earned in your market. So when it comes to the four largest firms, if it's 40% or more in total among those four firms, we're gonna say we definitely have an oligopoly. Alternatively, there's the Herfman, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the, the herfindahl hirschman index. I can do it, I can say it. Or the HHI. So on an exam, you could write HHI, given I just completely 
lost it on herfindahl hirschman index. Uh, when the herfindahl hirschman index is greater than 2,500, we say we have an oligopoly. To find the HHI, all you have to do is uh, take the market share of each company, square them individually, and then add them together. That's the herfindahl hirschman index. So, as an example, ooh, let's make your screen bigger. As an example, let's say there are six oil firms. Let's say there are six oil firms. There's seven, they're in the set Sorel, but let's make it six to be cheeky. Let's say those six oil firms have market shares of the biggest firms got 20%. The second biggest firm has 20%, so we got 50%, 20 percent, 10%, 10%, 5%, and 5 percent. These will be the uh, percentage of revenue that each individual firm is responsible for. So the fifth biggest firm brings in 5 percent of the revenue and the total oil market. Um, theoretically, of course, these numbers should add to 100, but sometimes in oligopolies, we only consider, say, the biggest eight or nine firms, and we already see that this number is going to be massive. And so there's a couple of tiny firms that might not be included sometimes. So to calculate the HHI, all you do is take each of the market shares, square them individually, and then sum them together. So, our biggest firm is 50. So our HHI for them, they would contribute, five times five is 25, that's two zeros, it'd be 2,500. Our next firm would add 400, then 100, 100, 25, and 25. All right, so we would get uh, 29, 31, 50. So in this example, our number will be 3150. Well, that what does that really tell us? If the answer is greater than 2,500, we say something's concentrated, meaning it's an oligopoly or a monopoly. If it's between 1,500 and 2,500, we say it's somewhat competitive. This is kind of a middle ground zone uh, where we might be going between a monopolistically competitive for, uh, industry and an oligopolistic industry. And then below um, this threshold of 1500, we say that the industry is strongly competitive, meaning that it's uh, monopolistically competitive or perfectly competitive. So strongly competitive is below 1,500. 1,500 to 2,500 is somewhat competitive, and above 2,500 is concentrated. And so if the answer is above 2,500, we are pretty sure we have a, an oligopoly. Now that's important for um, policy. Because sometimes firms like to merge together. So a merger is when two companies join together to form a bigger company. So if two companies get together, they are going to um, basically increase the HHI. They're going to make the market less competitive. And what that does is drive up prices, reduce quantities. It's going to be bad for consumers. 
And so um, we're going to talk about this more with Monopoly. But when we have a uh, government regulator deciding whether it's okay or not for uh, two companies to get together that will harm society, these are metrics, the HHI, the herfindahl hirschman Index, and um, the Four Firm Index, as it means to say, well, it's okay for these two companies to merge or not. If the answer is like less than 1,500, if these two companies get together, it's, it's not going to hurt competition very much. But if we get a couple of oligopolists joining together, that could give them a significant amount of power in a market and could drive up the prices that we pay for all sorts of goods and services. Okay. So, some examples of things that are considered oligopolies are discount department stores. Uh, Walmart, Target, what else we got out there? You think Walmart and Target alone would give us an HHI above 2,500? You uh, think they're four firm index? You think they're responsible for more than 40% of the market? Just those two firms? Yeah. So discount department stores are an oligopoly. So are automobile firms. Like I said, there's you know only a dozen or so companies that most people can afford. Large banks, there's only four in the United States at this point uh, that are national large banks. Aircraft and shipbuilding firms. How many companies does the Air Force get to buy fighter jets from, for instance? Lockheed, Boeing, and we're running at about the end of the list there. Smartphone companies, how many of you all got an Apple? We've asked this in class, and I know it's almost everybody. It's like one of you, there's a wink for the one of you, and I are Samsung people. Um, the rest of y'all have apples. That is a very not competitive market. And let me just throw this in. What kind of prices do we pay for our phones? Are they prices that we all love or are they prices that just keep going and going and going? That is an important thing to keep in mind because even if this stuff or even if you hate econ and everything I stand for, <laughs> this stuff is really important to your life because these are prices you have to pay. And so these are markets that are really important for you to understand as a consumer and as somebody who may want to work for one of these firms or somebody who might have an idea in an industry where an oligopolist um, will simply not let you compete. So this is going to be important for your context as a member of society. Uh, another example for fun is beer. Um, craft beer for all the discussion about craft beer only makes up uh, as of last year I think 13.2 percent of market share your uh, Bud Miller InBev Miller sorry Bud InBev uh, Miller Kurs they make up the lion's share of the beer market still and so beer is still an oligopoly but it's getting more competitive it's a weird market one of the few where it's getting more competitive all right. Now, why and how do oligopolies exist? The biggest reason why is what we call barriers to entry. Like I said, oligopolies have large, significant barriers to entry. Our ease of entry is very low. We haven't really talked that much about barriers to entry specifically. I just, in perfect competition and monopolistic competition, said, you know, it's pretty easy for you to join these markets and that's all we really needed to talk about but now we need to do a little bit more of a deep dive on them so a barrier to entry is any factor that keeps new potential companies from joining a market in particular where firms that are already there are earning economic profits so it's anything that keeps new companies whether that's your company or anyone else's, from joining a market um, when there's profits to be had. I'm going to talk about four really big ones, um, but a lot of things can be barriers to entry uh, in brackets. But these are the four ones we see most of all. The first is economies of scale. The second is owning a key resource. The third is advertising. And the fourth is 
the government imposing a barrier. So, in perfect competition, in a monopolistic competition, when there were profits to be had in the short run, what did we see happen? We saw new firms want to join the market. Um, they're making their life better. What do we do? Let's imitate them. Let's join that market. Let's start a restaurant. Let's start whatever job in that industry where we can improve our lives, make profits. That, that seeing someone else make a profit drove people to enter and what did that do? That drove your company's price and quantity down as things got more competitive. Your profits were eaten away, economic profits at least. Um, and you can't really block anybody from doing that. Well, the barrier to entry blocks other companies from doing that. It means that if you're an oligopolist, you can, from the short run to the long run, still make economic profits and charge really high prices into perpetuity until your you know industry goes away or the sun explodes or whatever it is. So the first one um, is probably the most technical and it's an idea we're going to build up across this chapter and Monopoly and that's economies of scale. It means that our average costs are going to fall and fall and fall as the company increases our output. Q or quantity. If economies of scale are important, a firm is going to reach the bottom of its average cost curve in the long run at a quantity that is a huge chunk of the entire market. If they're not important, you can minimize your average costs selling to just a few customers. This is a fixed cost story. Your fixed costs, right? or what you spend on your fixed inputs, the things you need to start up your company. It's building the factory, the infrastructure, buying all the things you need to get going. Sometimes there are industries where it takes a lot of money to get started. An oligopoly is one example. An oligopoly is one example. Um, sometimes when, um, like an oil company, or at a cable company, um, something like this, you need to spend millions or billions of dollars starting up. This is not going to be the case in our monopolistically competitive firms where, you know, like a restaurant or bar, you don't need to spend millions and billions of dollars to ever get the doors open and selling to customers. Let's um, take our cell phones in a restaurant as two counter examples. If you want to start a smartphone company to compete with Apple, what are you going to need? You are going to need, well, billions of dollars in a lot of time. You need, you know, developers and economists and accountants and lawyers. Um, you need to have good managers. You need to build, you know, some kind of a sales infrastructure. Then you're going to need to go to Australia and Africa and you know mine or set up you know distribution with people who are mining rare earth metals and plastics. Um, you're going to need to get a factory in Vietnam and China, uh, tr transportation infrastructure. Set yourself up, you know, with Verizon. It's gonna, it's gonna be a thing. <laughs> it's gonna be a thing that most of us don't have the capital to do. What if you want to start a restaurant? Do you think you could pull that off if you wanted to? Probably. It's a cutthroat industry. I'm not saying it's easy. Not at all. But if you wanted to start one, yeah, you could probably go to the bank and to family and do it if you wanted to. You might fail horribly, of course. But you know, maybe if you've worked in that industry a little bit and you've seen how to do it, you could get something going. And it's because... It's only going to cost, you know, in the hundred, low hundred thousand maybe to start up kind of dollar figure compared to several billion dollars of startup that you would need to square off against Apple. So what does that mean as far as average costs? Let's draw something. 
Get a little insight into that. Okay. Let's check this out. Let's talk about economies of scale. Oligopoly versus monopolistic competition. Mon comp. I'll put just price and costs here for now on the y-axis. And Q over here on our quantity axis. So we've got economies of scale, oligopoly versus monopolistic competition, price and cost on the Y, Q for quantity on the X. All right. So what are we looking at here? When it comes to you starting up, say, that smartphone company that we're talking about, what are we going to have happen? It's going to cost you, like I said, hundreds of millions or a billion dollars to start up and to compete with Apple. That means that your fixed costs are massive. If you sold one unit, what would your average total costs be? Remember, average total cost is total cost divided by quantity. Average total cost is total cost divided by quantity. Let's use a darker color here. Yeah. Average total cost is total cost divided by quantity. If all, all our costs are right now are a billion dollars in fixed costs, what are your average costs if you sell one unit, right? It's a billion dollars your average cost will be massive. And it's gonna take you selling lots and lots and lots of units for you to spread out those fixed costs and to get the bottom of that average total cost curve. So your ATC is gonna do I'll call that ATC oligopoly. Your average total cost curve is going to be largely the spreading effect going down over huge chunks of the market output. Now, if you started up a restaurant, conversely, what would your average total cost curve look like? In that case, compared to the whole market, compared to the whole market, your average total cost would be much closer to the origin because that fixed cost is not going to be a billion dollars. It's going to be, you know, $100,000. And you can spread that out much more quickly on a much smaller quantity in the denominator here. So what that means is for the monopolistically competitive firm, cumin cost is low. That means it's in reach for most people. If you wanted to start up a firm in a monopolistically competitive industry, it's within reach. You can sell to enough people to spread out those fixed costs. But when it comes to the oligopoly with economies of scale, that means that human cost is going to be a huge quantity, something that most of us can't afford to start up and get into. There's no way I, or I'm guessing you, but I don't know your whole life, so maybe you, but most of us, we don't have the resources to be able to buy the opportunity to have total costs that start so high and spread out over so much quantity. Most of us can't afford that billion dollars to start up in certain types of oligopolies. Okay? All right, let me go on an adventure of moving the screen. 
and let's talk about these three other common barriers. And then I'll push pause so you can check your phone. Okay. <laughs> Another barrier is ownership of a key resource. Um, I call this kind of mnemonically that you can't play without a ball and a bat. If you don't have access to inputs that are needed to produce, you can't participate in the market. Remember that our resources that we use to make a good or service are the land, labor, human capital, physical capital. And there are certain situations where one of those is critical to an industry and is not accessible by anybody but the firm already there. So I've got uh, on your slide, you should see Alcoa, the uh, aluminum company of America, and bauxite. You need bauxite to produce aluminum, and uh, Alcoa controls bauxite. And so if you wanted to participate in that game, you can't. You just can't. I want to start an aluminum company. Well, you need bauxite, and you have no access to it, because Alcoa does, and you're out. So, sorry, done. You can't compete with them. Uh, De Beers with diamonds. De Beers, um, you know, they're a, the smartest marketing move of all time, right? They uh, took these uh, rocks that were fairly worthless except for some mining purposes and used marketing to shift the demand curve out and make it very inelastic by convincing our grandparents and parents' generation that you need to buy a diamond to tell someone that you love them. And they um, basically bought up all the diamond inputs, and so it was very difficult for you to get into the diamond game and compete with them because they controlled where all the diamonds uh, were coming from and where they were going to. So can't play without a ball and a bat. And yeah, they are quite the marketing case. Another barrier is advertising, and that is, we touched on this in monopolistic competition where smaller firms try and use it to keep the long run at bay, but big oligopolies can use advertising to make it impossible to compete against them virtually so. Um, so firms basically attempt to convince you that you really need their good or service so that you can't or people don't switch to a competitor especially a new entrant competitor you've never heard of and haven't been educated about and haven't been trained or taught that it is a good or a bad thing. If this works, if this is successful, it's super expensive, super expensive, super difficult for competitors to join the market and to compete and to change anybody's preferences. Um, they basically create uh, loyalty and long-term or lifelong consumers of their goods or services. So as two examples, uh, you should see Procter & Gamble and Chevy and & Ford. Uh, Chevy & Ford spend over $2 billion a year um, on advertising. And if you've ever watched sports, uh, you absolutely know that's true. Because uh, there's a Chevy truck ad and a Ford truck ad, every other ad across every NFL you know, commercial break. Procter & Gamble right, is a company that a lot of people don't really specifically know what they do, um, but they basically make everything we buy in our house, right? And a lot of us, uh, I'm sure if you reflect on it, have either you or a parent guardian have some kind of laundry detergent or paper towel or uh, dishwashing liquid or something that the parent or spouse or guardian or you or whatever always buys, right? My mom always had Tide. Just always. It's just always there. And, you know, Procter & Gamble, they make Tide. They make a lot of things we buy. And they spend a lot of money making it so we go like, Tide's good. I want Tide. Every time I go in the Target, I get the Tide. Um, and you just you've got your blinders on and you don't see anything else or I brush my teeth with Crest. They make that too. I just do it, okay? And so if you're a new company trying to compete with Tide or Crest in those, you know, specific markets, 
it's going to be really, really difficult to break into that market and compete with them because they're spending $4 billion a year to get us to all go like Titan Crest are pretty great. All right. So advertising can be very powerful barrier to entry. And then the government can impose barriers. And this can be for better or for worse or for, mm, but it's, it's a thing. Uh, a couple of things that most economists tend to be cool with are patents and copyrights. This is when the government grants exclusive right to a good or service to somebody uh, because they've put in the time, money, and effort to create something that uh, better society. So, right, patents are, in uh, our system, an exclusive right to a product for 20 years. It's a very, you know, strong legal barrier to entry. Um, and my, my dad has 20 of these um, for uh, inventions that he made, but they're also like things like pharmaceuticals. Um, so life-saving drugs, these things cost millions of dollars to develop. And if a company spent millions of dollars to create a drug and then someone can steal it the second it comes out and make a generic, these companies wouldn't put in the resources uh, to generate things that, you know, fight horrible diseases. And so that makes, that would make society worse off. So to make sure that firms have an incentive to do that, we say, okay, you get 20 years to recoup your uh, investment. Now that's because we have private investment in you know research and that's a whole different topic. But because we do, patents protect those investments. Copyrights are similar. Um, they're given to you for your life and then your heirs get it for 70 more years. Uh, thank Disney for some of those. Um, but these protect creative works. So my dissertation and uh, my published research papers are copyrighted, uh, but music, uh, plays, books, um, these things all get copyrighted. And so when you create something that you know elevates society, is a new idea, creates art that makes you know life a beautiful place, uh, you get to recoup your investment. Basically, that's what a copyright does. Occupational licensing is supposed to um, make it so that you need a license to do a particular job. So sometimes this is things like a doctor, and I'm fine with that one. If someone's going to operate on me, I want to know that someone has said they're good at operating. Um, but other times it's maybe a little more corrupt, like hair braiders in Atlanta. You have to have a license for that. Sometimes it's things where it's more... You know, we knew somebody on the city council, and uh, we didn't want people to compete with us, so uh, this needs to be a licensed thing. Um, now, one barrier that economists universally dislike are tariffs and quotas. Um, economists are 100% in agreement that tariffs and quotas, uh, barriers against foreign competition, are bad for society. Um, a tariff is a tax on an import, so that means that you have to, if you want to send your good to another country, you have to pay a tax to do that um, to that country um, and a quota or, or else the people buying in that country have to pay the tax. Uh, but either way, you pay. Um, and a quota is a limit on the amount of a good that can be brought into a country. Um, we have several of these in play right now, um, and you know it's hard to see what that does, but um, it makes everyone hundreds and thousands of dollars worse off a year because we do not get to buy the things that other places have a comparative advantage in, and our comparative advantage uh, isn't allowed to thrive, and we prop up uh, industries that we're not particularly efficient at. Current um, trade policies have, uh, at least in one particular industry, cost the taxpayer uh, $3 million per job to uh, sustain, and these are 
not jobs that make $30 million a year. So these tend to be really inefficient. You saw with the production possibilities frontier, why trade makes people better off. It gets us beyond our production possibility frontier. It lets us consume something that is previously unattainable. So blocking trade through tariffs and quotas is not something any economist is okay with. All right, so in summary, barriers to entry preclude new firms from entering the market. And without new entrants eroding profits, firms are basically going to be able to charge a high price in perpetuity, just forever, uh, until you know the sun explodes or whatever. So economic profits can be sustained forever. What this means is if you are an oligopolist, this is swell. <laughs> you can make a ton of money for a long time. If you consume from an oligopolist, if you are on the consumer side of this, it means you are going to pay high prices. Um, so awesome. All right, so we're going to start talking about uh, game theory and oligopoly. Let's take a brief timeout. And we're back. So we've talked about the definition of what an oligopoly is and how it exists as a market structure with a small number of firms selling identical or differentiated products, but defined by having large and significant barriers to entry. So when we ask how do oligopolies behave, this can be a bit of a puzzle given the tools that we've developed so far. It is, let's say there's two companies, you know, you can think of Coke and Pepsi, something like that, who have 50% of the market each and um, sell their good at the same price. What could they do? They could say split the market in perpetuity or what might you do if you were trying to, uh, you know, gain power to market? You might try and undercut them, right? Cut the price a little bit. But what might they do in return? Cut the price in response further than you? So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna match them? Are you gonna go a step lower? Are you gonna try and go back to the original price? Um, might you try to cooperate? Might you try to compete? I don't know, it could depend. So we use a different tool called game theory to provide insight into oligopoly behavior. And all sorts of other interesting stuff we'll talk about too. So game theory is the study of the strategic interaction between agents. And so if you're thinking about um, an econ uh, major or minor, uh, I teach the upper level game theory elective um, here. So Keep that in mind if you're looking for a course in the future. It's a great class. Uh, game theory is the study of the strategic interaction between economic agents. So anytime strategy matters in our interactions, game theory is the branch of microeconomics we use to understand that or to model it or to try and figure out how people will or could or have behaved. Um, so this is basically when one agent's payoff or welfare depends not just on their own choices, but on those of others. So with Coke and Pepsi, Coke's profits don't just depend on what Coke does. It also depends on what Pepsi does. This is because there's so few firms that strategically they are very interlinked with each other. In perfect competition or monopolistic competition, there's too many companies for anybody to have much significance in terms of strategy. You know, if we're talking all the restaurants in Tampa in a monopolistically competitive market, pretty competitive, if one company changes their price, that's probably not going to affect me that much. Now, if they all do it, again, now that's market forces. But with oligopoly, we're talking about just these two companies. If Coke raises their price or lowers their price, that will drive a lot of what Pepsi is going to do, not just what's happening in-house at Pepsi. This is true with you and me as well, right? We're in a strategic situation because how you act doesn't just affect you, it also affects me. 
And how I affect doesn't just affect me, it also affects you. So both of our behavior is interlinked. It's strategically interdependent. And so that means that we're in a game theoretic situation. Well, that also means that uh, dating, family, sports, politics, the law, all sorts of things we use game theory to study because they're all strategic, okay? So in our uh, industry applications here, this is incredibly useful for oligopoly because any of our firms in an oligopoly, their profits don't just depend on them, but they depend on their competitors as well. And what that means is that we're gonna take a little break from our average total cost curve, um, modeling of firms, and we're going to use game theory to look at their behavior instead. So maybe, hopefully, this is a fun little holiday from drawing a graph. So let's define some important terms, and then I'll show you how to do a couple of different uh, ways we model game theory. All games have rules, strategies, and payoffs. Rules basically determine um, the structure of the game, all the allowable actions, and how it's set up. Rules are how many players are there in the, in the game? Are there two companies, three companies? Do they move at the same time? Do they take turns moving? That is, do they both show up to market or a trade show having invent, uh, developed a new product or not? Do they move at the same time? Or do they move in turns? Like chess, where you see um, this company just developed a product, we need to respond. Those are in the rules of the game. Do we play the game once? Do we play it 10 times? Do we play it infinitely? Um, there's different time limits on the game as well that the rules incorporate. Um, strategies are basically the actions that the individuals in the game take. Our agents, our decision makers, are often called players because of the word game. And so a strategy are all the actions that a player can take or an agent can take. Um, they're basically, I call them the verbs. It's uh, what things can you actually do in a strategic situation, and we'll look at that uh, pretty deeply. And then the payoffs are the consequences of the game. This can be um, in utility, this can be in profits, this could be in anything that um, inspires your behavior in this strategic situation. So payoffs are just the results of everyone making their choices in a strategic game. What do we get at the end of that game? Those are our payoffs. So let's start talking about simultaneous move games. This is when the rules state that agents or players select their strategies at the more or less exact same time. Now this doesn't have to be literally the exact second in time and space. It has to mean basically that you make a strategy selection and you can't change it before you see what someone else does. So this is two companies deciding to develop a new product or not. They didn't make that decision at the exact same time, but they'd both show up at the trade show and say, I have a product or I don't. Or, you know, if you've got, you know, uh, your friend set you up on a date or you've got a tender date or something, uh, whether you decide to show up or not and whether they decide to show up or not, you didn't decide at the exact same second to show or not, but the consequences come out at the same time. The results of the game of whether they showed up and you showed up, that doesn't get determined until seven o'clock when you're both supposed to meet. So that's a simultaneous move game because you, you have to decide whether you're going to show up without being able to see what your opponent has done. Um, now, when we do these models, we're assuming that agents are aware of all the potential uh, strategy and payoff uh, combinations. That is, you understand the implications of your behavior, and you understand that you are strategically uh, interdependent with the other players. That is, you understand you're in the game, and you understand what the ramifications of your choices are. That is, how it affects you and how it affects them. And they understand how it affects them and how it affects you. And we're assuming that, you know, we play by the rules because it's a model. Um, if your model doesn't describe the rules or doesn't describe the situation, then of course you need a new or a different model that, that does describe that situation.
Okay. So, as we study simultaneous move games, uh, let's define a couple uh, more terms so that we can actually get into the modeling on the old whiteboard over here. Um, first, our collusion and cooperative equilibrium. A cooperative equilibrium is any equilibrium where players um, try to cooperate to increase their payoffs. Um, if we apply that to business or industry, we would call that collusion. And that is an agreement among firms to fix prices and not compete with each other. This is legally not supposed to happen in the United States, um, at least explicitly so. So um, to have that stated cooperative equilibrium of, hey, let's both set our prices real high, that's not supposed to happen. Firms would only do this if it was in their best interest. That is, um, strategically, it would make them better off. Sometimes there are situations, uh, game theoretically, where both people taking an action would make everyone better off, be, but because you're in a strategic game, it just won't happen. Strategy will make it so that you try and watch out for yourself and not let someone else hurt you, and what ends up happening is everybody's worse off. And that is non-cooperative equilibrium. A non-cooperative equilibrium is an equi equilibrium in which the players or the firms do not cooperate. They do what is in their best strategic self-interest, and they play strategies designed to best their self-interest, to get the best possible thing they can according to their self-interest. Um, so we're going to study non-cooperative equilibria in this game in a, and as we look at game theory and show how that differs from a world in which it'd be great if we could compete. But because of strategy, we won't. All right. Three more and then I promise. It's game theory time. All right. I'm going to use some terms, uh, one of which is dominant strategy. A dominant strategy is an action that you can take that will make you best off no matter what anyone else does. Games do not have to have dominant strategies. But if they do, it makes them very easy to solve. So it's a, a dominant strategy is a strategy that is best for one agent or player no matter what everyone else does. If something's always best for someone, it's easy to figure out what they're going to do. Okay, So some of our games will have dominant strategies, some will not, but I'll use that term and it makes some games really easy to solve. Um, the next is the prisoner's dilemma, and this is a particular type of game, and it's the most famous game in game theory. And it is a game in which agents have dominant strategies, and it makes it so that everyone actually is not in a Pareto optimal outcome. That is, by doing what's best for you, it makes everybody worse off than they could be. The prisoner's dilemma is, is where game theory, really, we, we start it when we're um, learning it, and it's one of the most um, kind of quirky things that we see human beings do. It's really, really fun. Um, and then the Nash Equilibrium is our solution concept. A Nash Equilibrium is an equilibrium in which every player basically follows what's called a best response or a best reply. They do what they think is best for them in response to looking at everyone else and then thinking, I bet they're doing what's best for them. When everyone does what's best for them, while considering the strategies of the other players, we get a Nash equilibrium. Um, we capitalize Nash when we write it because uh, Nash is uh, the OG of game theory and Nobel Prize winner. Um, rest in peace. Pour one out for your homies. Um, somebody who deserves respect. So Nash is something we capitalize. That is someone's name. All right. So we're going to start with a simultaneous move one-shot game. 
This is a type of game in which each agent selects their strategy at the same time, and we play the game one time, okay? Now our particular example I'm gonna solve for us is going to be a pricing game for a duopoly. We're going to have two companies show up with the price of a new product. And to make this very simple, we're going to have two strategy choices for each agent, basically a low price versus a high price, okay? To do this, we are going to have something called a normal form game. It's a little tiny table that we use to solve game theoretic, to model and solve game theoretic situations. Um, this is also called a payoff matrix, um, a game matrix. It's called several different titles depending on what you're reading or looking at. Um, what's called a normal form game. So let's have an example in which we've got two companies. Um, let's have Chevy and Ford, because this is America. Who are playing a simultaneous move, one shot game. And now, let's make you bigger, so that we can all do some game theory. This little box is our normal form game. And let's say we've got our two companies, Shabbing and Ford, okay? And let's say both these two companies are gonna show up to the Detroit Auto Show with a new family sedan, and they are going to show up with a new MSRP, uh, you know, uh, price at which the uh, cars to be sold. So let's say those two price options to make this easy. We've got a high price of 20, 24,000 and a low price of 20,000. I'm going to write that for both the firms. And we can start by talking about the players, the rules, uh, the strategies, the payoffs. So our players are going to be Chevy and Ford. In game theory parlance, we call them player one and player two. So Chevy here is called player one, and they're also called the row player because we're going to put their strategies down the rows. That means is that these two options are Chevy's strategy selections. They can show up and uh, set the price of 24,000, or they can show up and set a price of 20,000. Ford is going to be called player two, or the column player. Put some parentheses. They're called the column player because their player, uh, this player's strategies look down the columns. So this is Ford's high price option of 24,000, and this is Ford's low price option of 20,000. Now, in these boxes, we are going to put the payoffs, the outcomes of the game that result from a combination of strategic choices from all the players. So let's say that I'm going to put a hundred million, a hundred million. I'm going to put 120 million, 50 million. I'll put 50 million, 120 million. And I'll put 60 million. 60 million. Let's see if we can zoom you in even more. There we go. In these boxes, we again have our payoffs, where it's always listed player one's payoff first and player two's payoff second. 
So if you want to go in and put player one, player two throughout, you absolutely could. What that means is each of these boxes represent the four possible combinations that could occur in the strategic game. So what that means is if Chevy showed up and played $24,000 as their strategy in the game, and Ford showed up and charged $24,000 in the game, Chevy player one would earn $100 million, and Ford player two would earn $100 million as well. It means if Chevy played $20,000, well, while Ford played $24,000, Chevy would get $120 million, while Ford would only get $50 million. So when it comes to this game, right, technically, we have a game in which we've got two players. Do a matrix thing, get out of the way of myself. The game is played once, and the game has simultaneous moves. So we've got Chevy and Ford playing game one time, showing up at the auto show with their new car and its price, and their simultaneous moves, meaning they both got to show up with all the literature and everything ready to go, and neither firm is going to be able to look at the other's choice before they decide what to do. They've both got to already make a decision before they show. All right? So when it comes to strategies, It is simply a pricing decision. Um, in game theory, we can look at a lot more prices than two, but to start out, let's just have a high price and a low price. And then when it comes to payoffs, payoffs, um, let's just have it be profits in dollars, where of course firms want to maximize profits and get the most that they possibly can. Does that follow? Hope so. All right. So that's the structure of the game. Now the question is, how do you solve this thing? Again, what we're looking for is called a Nash equilibrium. That is our solution concept again. And it says that every player makes their best possible choice considering the strategies of their opponents and assuming that your opponents out there are trying to do its best for them as well. So to solve a game in best replies, what you do is think about what would you do to make yourself as best off in any scenario that your opponent could find themselves in. So to actualize that, let's put yourself in Chevy's shoes and say, hi, I'm Chevy. Hi, Chevy. I can show up and I can set a price of 24000 or I can set a price of 20000 When would I want to do either of these options? Let's think about that. Let's consider what if Ford chooses a price of $24,000. If they did that, if they set that price of $24,000, what would I want to do? Well, if I set my price at $24,000 and they set their price at $24,000, I would get $100 million. But if I set my price at $20,000, I'd get $120 million. And obviously, I would rather get $120 million than $100 million. So if I think they're going to charge $24,000, I want to undercut them. I want to set this lower price, and I want to walk out of there with $120 million in profits. Now what if Ford charged $20,000? In that case, if I set my price at $24,000, I would get $50 million. But if I set my price at $20,000, I'd get $60 million. Which would I rather have? $60, obviously, right? $60 million is better than $50 million. So in that case, I'll want to charge $20,000. That means that at Chevy, we have a dominant strategy here of $20,000. Again, you don't have to have a dominant strategy. 
But if you do, it makes the game pretty easy to solve. What it tells you is that in this particular game, regardless of what Ford does, Chevy's best off setting the low price. Okay? Now let's think about this from Ford's perspective. We can set a price at Ford of $24,000 or $20,000, okay? What do we want to do? We're going to want to look at this from the perspective of what if Chevy charges a price, what's the best thing that we can do? What's our best response to them? So if Chevy shows up with a price of $24,000, what are we going to want to do at Ford? If we set our price at 24,000, we would get 100 million. But if we set our price at 20,000, we get 120 million. 120 million beats 100 million, and so that means I would much rather set a price of $20,000. We'd like to undercut Chevy. If we set a lower price than them, it's the same, we could probably sell a lot more units and make a bunch more money. What if though Chevy chooses a price of $20,000? If we set our price at $24,000, we'd get $50 million. If we set it at $20,000, we'd get $60 million. So what are we going to want to do? Well, I don't want 50, I want 60. So I have a dominant strategy as well at Ford to set up my strategy at $20,000. That's because I want to maximize profits, I want to undercut Chevy, and I don't want to be undercut by Chevy. You would prefer, you know, kind of cheat them and not be cheated, right? That's what this is about. This is an example of the prisoner's dilemma. This is an example where by following a dominant strategy, everybody's actually worse off, right? If we could cooperate, there's a feasible cooperative equilibrium in the world where we both set a price of 100 million, or sorry, a price of 24,000. If we could both set our price at 24,000, we each could make a profit of 100 million, right? Well, would we? No, because there's an immediate incentive to, in my boardroom, go like, <laughs> let's set the price lower and cheat them and make more profits, right? If we made some kind of an agreement, you know, off the, under the table, let's both set our price at 24,000, make 100 million. It's illegal. But what would, it, what would you even have an incentive to do? You'd go back to headquarters and immediately go, <laughs> we told them 24, let's do 20. Because we're going to make more money. And what would the other company do? They do the same thing. What ends up happening is the prisoner's dilemma. We all have a dominant strategy to set a price of $20,000. $20, and what do we end up doing? We actually, everybody, are not Pareto optimal. We're made worse off, we all get $60 million. But that is what is going to happen. I've run experiments, I've seen this, this is what happens in, in these situations. So when we solve the game, we're solving for something called a Nash equilibrium again. That is the solution concept here. And what you do is you write strategies that each player deploys. So in this game, it's player one chooses 20,000. So that's Chevy's choice. And then player two chooses 20,000. That's Ford's choice, player two. So these are always written, strategy of player one, strategy of player two. They're pretty easy to see. If you follow this method, it's anywhere where arrows or underlines both happen in the same box, right? You see the arrows are converging on one box. I have underlined payoffs in one box. That's the only place they happen here. Conceptually, how many Nash equilibria could we have in a game? Well, if there's two strategy choices, we could either have zero, one, like this game, or two. That's how many times arrows can point to the same box, basically, or where we underline paths in the same box. It's only going to happen in zero, one, or two of these boxes. Okay.
All right, let's do an example of the prisoner's dilemma um, using actual prisoners. So let's set ourselves up a normal form game. And I want to do this to kind of uh, illustrate that um, this is useful for explaining oligopoly behavior, but it has um, lots of bigger implications about strategic behavior. So let's say there are two um, horrifying criminals. Let's call them um, Morgan and Sid. Uh, just two people um, who are made up entirely. And let's say that they've committed some horrible crimes, just unspeakable acts against humanity, and the police have picked them up and are now holding them prisoner in separate rooms and saying, we're going to offer you a deal. If you talk, we can put a way more on the other. Um, this is a thing that gets done in interrogation, of course. And it gives both of these players in the game two strategy choices. They can keep mom, that is, old-timey way of see, keep your mouth shut, or they can confess, and they can say what they've done to all of person kind. So let's say that if they both keep their mouth shut, the payoffs would be two years in prison for each one. Again, remember that this first number is the payoff to player one, and the second one is the payoff to player two. Now, this is a little different than money because years in prison are a bad thing. So here, a lower number would be better. So when you look at payoffs, you kind of got to think about what's the human psychology of how we would react to this type of number. So let's fill this in and then I'll explain them. Let's say if Morgan confesses and Sid keeps mom, Morgan will get zero years, and all of it will be pinned on Sid, who will get 20 years. Now, if Morgan keeps mom and Sid confesses, Morgan would get 20 years, but Sid would be released, get zero years. But if they both confess, they're going to get 10 years on each of them. So what's going to happen here? Let's look at this game theoretically. If you're Morgan and you know you're up against Sid, you think about what should I do in any possible strategic situation here. So if Sid keeps mom, if I also keep mom, I would get two years. But if I confess I get zero, I would be out. So what would I do? I prefer zero years, right? So I draw an arrow or I underline the payoff to say, if Sid keeps mum, I will confess. And if Sid confesses, if I keep mum, I'll get 20 years. Oof. But if I confess, I'll get 10 years. 20, 10, I'd rather have 10 years in the slammer, so I would pick to confess. I have a dominant strategy to confess. All right, so what we know is in this game, you're better off no matter what as player one, as Morgan here, the role player, to be a confessor. Now let's look at this from the perspective of player two, of Sid. Now Sid looks at the situation and says, should I keep my mouth shut or should I talk? If Morgan's going to keep her mouth shut, and I keep my mouth shut, I get my two years. But if I confess I'm out now, and I'm pinning it on my other player opponent, who gets 20 years. Two versus zero, I'm gonna walk. Zero is better than two. And if Morgan confesses, 
If I keep my mouth shut, I'm going to be stuck there for 20 years. I don't want that. If I can confess, when she confesses, I'll only get 10. We'll both get 10. 10 is better than 20 years. So what we have here is the prisoner example of the prisoner's dilemma, where the arrows converge, we underline both payoffs in this bottom right box, and everyone is made worse off by following their strategic incentives. Obviously, the Pareto optimal outcome, everyone's better off, no one's worse off if everyone keeps their mouth shut, only two years for each. But the incentive to get out immediately and the incentive to not be put away for 20 years dictates that each agent will confess. And so the Nash equilibrium the Nash equilibrium is right, the dominant strategy of each. Player one confesses. And player two also confesses. Right, you don't have to write player one and player two here, but you have to write the strategy for player one, that is Morgan will confess, and the strategy of player two, that is Sid will confess. And so that's what an answer looks like to a normal form game or a simultaneous form game. Now, let's talk a little bit about repeated and sequential games. So let's involve time. Or as we say, intertemporal issues. That is, can we break the prisoner's dilemma? Is the game different if it's played more than once? Well, in general, if the game has a finite end, that is, we know how many times the game will end, we will get the Nash equilibrium every time the game is played. So if Chevy and Ford in our first example had to play that game 10 times and they knew it was going to be played 10 times, then they would set that low price and play the Nash Equilibrium, the prisoner's dilemma, each time. And it's because they would look to the end of the game, it's called backwards induction, and go, what's my opponent going to do in that 10th round? They're going to try to cheat me and avoid being cheated by me. They're going to play the low price. So what should I do in the ninth round? And then what should I do in the eighth round? And they go, what should I do in the seventh round and the sixth round? And then what do we end up doing? We all play the prisoner's dilemma the entire time because you know they're going to cheat you and they know you're going to cheat them. And we get a non-cooperative equilibrium. Everybody plays Nash. Now, if the game's played infinitely, interestingly, if people value the future, you can see different outcomes. You could see people try to cooperate. If you have to play the game basically every day and you never know when it's going to end, if, if these two have to play this game every day forever, they might try to keep mum and see what their opponent does before they do anything in response. Uh, Chevy and Ford might say, let's try the 24,000. If we have to play this game, this price game every day forever, Let's see if we can set the high price, and they will too. Um, so it kind of depends on the parameter of the game. And in Eco 340, we do a lot more detailed study of what does time do to the game and how do we look at uh, game theoretic situations that can last forever. Um, you know, like being in business against another oligopolist or uh, being, you know, uh, married to somebody for the rest of your life. All right, let's talk about sequential move games. Sequential move games are when agents take turns making decisions. So this is much more the idea of chess. One player moves, another player sees that move, and responds to it, at least in what we're going to do in this class. You see the move of someone else, and you get to respond to that. Or you make a move, and you know someone's going to respond to your move, so you've got to think about that before you move. Um, a lot of times... Uh, we want to do the very favorite thing that we want. And if we're in a strategic situation, uh, someone else might not have the same very favorite thing. So you have to think about strategic considerations before you move. So 
In sequential move games, agents take turns, and uh, we use a method, like I said, called backwards induction to solve this game. And what we're looking for is called a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. We'll be able to call that an SPNE. An SPNE. But what it means is that everyone plays the Nash move, the best response to everyone else for yourself, every time you get a turn. So it's a specific type of Nash equilibrium, it's more specific, that says that anytime you get a chance to take a turn, you will play the Nash option. You'll make your best move in response to everyone else's strategic considerations. So let's play a sequential move game. Let's play a sequential move game. Let's do it. All right. So when agents take turns, we don't use this normal form game. We don't use the payoff matrix or payoff box, whatever you want to call it. We use something called a game tree. We use something called a game tree or a payoff tree to look at how agents model the turns they take and the payoffs they can get based on their strategic choices. So let's look at a simple version of a game tree. So this is a simple version of a game three, game three, game tree. Let's zoom in or expand the screen rather. And it shows how we are going to begin, it's called it an initial node, where player one is the first person to move. So we write player one first and then we have branches of a tree that come out that illustrate possible choices that player one can make. It basically is laying out all the infinite timelines that could possibly exist. So if player one makes a particular move, we'll go down one branch of the tree, and this other side would never exist. But we need to know that it could exist and what its possible ramifications are in order to decide that we should have gone down this branch of the tree. So. Once you move down that branch, player two is the next player. And we, of course, we could have lots more players, but we'll stick to two. Player two is the next player, and they respond to the world that was given to them. Right? Player two will be listed here and here, but they only get to move in one world. So if player one went this way, player two will never get to make a decision here player two would be relegated to making a decision between a couple of strategy choices. But this is conceivable and player two, you know, before you know the game, before you play the game, know that all of these things are options. Okay? At the end of the game, once everyone's made their decisions, payoffs will be earned at the end. It's called the terminal node um, and it's the end of the game. So let's have an example for an oligopoly. Let's say there's two car companies making SUVs, okay? First is Powell Motors, and second is Canyon Arrow. So we've got Powell Motors and then Canyon Arrow. Okay. So what that means is we've got one company who's going to make some decisions, and then another company is going to respond to it. Once the second company responds to it, payoffs get uh, dispensed or turned out to everybody. 
So let's say this is a game in which Pal Motors sets a high price or a low price for its SUV, and Canyon Arrow decides whether it wants to enter the SUV market with a product or not. So, let's say Pal Motors has two strategy choices, $82,000 or $60,000 for its SUV. And then Canyonero responds to that with its own decision. To either enter or don't enter the market. Canyonero can either enter or don't enter the market. Okay? And at the end of the game, we have payoffs. Let's write these up. Let's write these up as follows. All right. These are the payoffs. Let's have them be in terms of return on investment. So a higher number is better than a lower number. And anytime you write these, they're written in order of the players. So the first number or the top number will always be player one. And the bottom number, or the second number if they're written horizontally, would be player two, okay? So what that means is if Pal Motors charged $82,000 in the market for their SUV, and Canero entered the market, both companies would get a negative 10%. That'd be bad. As opposed to, let's say Pal Motors has a $60,000 SUV, Canero doesn't enter, Pal Motors would get 40%, and Canyonero would get 0%, okay? So again, it's all about the strategic interaction of the choices, but this time, Canyonero has the opportunity to look at Pal Motors, what the price is that they set, and then strategically respond to it. So again, this is your chess sort of thing. This is someone says something to you, and you have a chance to respond to what they say, or what they've done, okay? So this is a game where our rules say we've got two players. The game is played once. But this time we have sequential moves. Our strategies for Pal Motors, we've got 82,000 and 60,000. And for Canyon Arrow, enter and don't enter. And then for payoffs, let's say it's our return on investment. So a higher number is a better number. Okay? Now, to solve this type of game, what we need to do is backwards induct to solve a sub-game perfect Nash equilibrium. So this time our solution concept is a Nash equilibrium, but what we're looking for is a sub-game perfect Nash equilibrium. Again, you can write an S, P, and E. To backwards induct, the game is played forwards, but in order to understand life, we have to look at it backwards, to uh, paraphrase Kierkegaard there. So Powell Motors moves first, but by backwards inducting, what they do is they go, what would player two do if I set my price at 82,000? What would player two do if I set my price at 60,000? 
And then by thinking about how your opponent will respond to you, you can then eliminate what won't happen in the world and decide what is best for you to do in the world. So let's say, uh, let's say Powell Motor sets a price of $82,000. The backwards induction here is looking at Canyon Arrow and saying, what will player two do in response to player one? So we actually solve player two's moves first and then go back to the top and backwards and duck to what player one will do. When you are a player one in a game, you've got to backwards and duck and think, how will player two respond to me? Okay? So, what if we set our price at $82,000? What will Canyon Arrow do? If Canyon Arrow enters the game, this is their payoff, negative 10%. If they don't enter the game, break even, they're not even playing, right? So what would you rather have, zero or negative 10? They'd rather have zero, so what we can say is, I'm gonna draw a little arrow there, if we set a price of 82,000, Canyon Arrow will not enter. And what I like to do is prune the game tree. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah, I know. I like to cross out what will never happen. Canyon Arrow rationally would not enter the game. So scratch it out. Get rid of the considerations that aren't going to happen and simplify the world. What if Powell Motors sets a price of $60,000? Canyon Arrow can enter for 22% or not enter for 0%. What would Canyon Arrow rather have? Well, 22% is way better than 0%, so they will enter the game, right? They're looking for this 22%. Over here, they wanted the 0, but over here, they want the 22. So what do we see? A pruning of don't enter. It's not going to happen. Now, if you're Powell Motors, do you like that? No, of course not. This is the highest number in the game for you. This is what you want. If you walk up to this game, and this is what I see a lot of people do in terms of uh, mistaken strategic behavior because they haven't learned how to think game theoretically, they walk up to a situation and say, this is my favorite thing I want in the world. So let's set our price to $60,000 and go after this 40%. And don't consider how people will respond to you it takes a lot of strategic thinking. It takes a lot of self-awareness to really empathize and put yourself in the position of the player too and think about how are they going to respond to you. So if you set that price at 60000 as Powell Motors, Canyon Arrow will enter. Your favorite thing in the world is not feasible. Now what we've done through backwards induction is eliminating two things that will never happen and limited ourselves to the two that will. We now know at Powell, if we set 82,000, Canyon Arrow won't enter, we'll get 30%. If we set our price at 60, Canyon Arrow will enter, we'd get 22%. So now we're comparing 30% versus 22%. Which would we rather have, 30 or 22? Well, 30 of course, right? So what will we do? I'll draw an arrow to show that. We will go down this branch of the tree, this side will never happen. Canyon Neuro will not enter. I'll get 30%, they'll get 0%. Did I want 40? Of course, can't have it. This is the best that we can do. So our subgame perfect Nash equilibrium is going to be 82,000. Don't enter. This is the SPNE, the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. Player one strategy first, player two strategy second. And it is the solution concept to the game. Time out. All right, everybody, we are back. All right, we're going to do. A couple more things here. Um, I've got some examples listed here for you. Um, energy economics and uh, gun laws. There's a couple of articles that you could uh, take a look at there. Um, we'll use those uh, given a chance to uh, 
do some game theory work in class or in our virtual class. Uh, so those are the chapter 14 readings that are on Blackboard. Um, but uh, with the remainder of our game theory lecture, I'd like to um, do a couple more examples just to make you feel uh, comfortable about the material. So um, we're going to do another example of a uh, sequential move game and then a couple of uh, normal form game examples. So we're going to do mergers and acquisitions. We'll do political posturing. Uh, I've got basically Obama versus Ryan in the House of Reps, but this has happened in the Bush White House, the Obama White House. Um, kind of uh, example of political strategy. And then uh, I'll do what's called a coordination game so that you can see a different type of game. There's many types of games. Um, the Prisoner's Dilemma is only one of many types of games, so just want to do another type of example. So let's get set up with that. All right, so our first example, we're going to look at another sequential move game. Just would like to have you uh, have at least another example on hand in order to uh, solve these problems for yourself. So let's say there's two companies, Caterpillar and Globolink, where Caterpillar is going to make an offer to Globolink to, uh, off to buy a product that it uses in its trailer or its tractors and its mining equipment. So Caterpillar will go to Global Link and say, we'd like to buy this uh, piece of equipment from you to put in our, in our big machines. And Global Link is going to respond to them by saying, we're cool with that or we're not cool with that. So Caterpillar is going to be player one, the giant earth moving Fortune 50 company. Um, and they're going to show up in the market and talk to Global Link. All right, so Global Link is going to be a much smaller company, and they're going to sell a GPS component that Cat uses in its giant mining equipment. So let's say that Caterpillar could make an offer of a low price, so let's say a $2,000 offer, or they could offer a high price of $5,000. And then let's say Global Link can either accept or reject that offer. Then let's have payoffs be just in straight up profits. Where if CAT offers 2,000 and Global Link accepts, CAT would get 1.2 billion and Global Link would get 5 million. Then, if CAT offers $2,000 and Global Link rejects, CAT would get $1 billion, Global Link would get $4 million. Next, if CAT offers $5,000 and Global Link accepts, CAT would get $1.1 billion and Global Link would get $7 million. And then finally, if CAT offers 5,000 and Global Link rejects, Cat will get 1 billion and Global Link will get 4 million. Again, so our goal here is to solve this game and find the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, the SP and E. So to do that, we need to backwards induct. Cat does move first, but before they do that, they need to go, how will Global Link, Global Link respond to any of our potential strategic moves? If we went and offered $2,000, what would Global Link do? They could accept for $5 million, or they could reject for $4 million. What would they do? Obviously, they'd prefer $5 million to $4 million, and so they would accept. They would accept that offer. 
and I prune out, reject, because that's not going to happen. Then Caterpillar over here, if they offer 5,000, what would Global Link do? They could accept for 7 million, but they can reject for 4 million. So we can see that seven's better than four. Cat will accept that offer. And I'll prune, I'll prune reject. So that means that no matter what we do at Cat, Global Link will accept our offer. This is a game where there is a dominant strategy for player two. They're always better off accepting it. And that makes it very easy for player one to solve a game. Again, the last example did not have dominant strategies, but this one does. So Cat now looks at this and says, well, if I offer 2,000, I would get 1.2 billion because I know Global Link would accept. And if I offer 5,000, I get 1.1 billion because I know Global Link will accept. Well, 1.1, 1.2, we'll take the 1.2. So our strategy selection will be to play $2,000. So as a consequence, The subgame perfect Nash equilibrium will be two thousand dollars and accept. Player one strategy first, player two's strategy second. Let's have two more games. I'm going to have President and Congress playing a game. And I'm going to have Dr. Hood, some fictional character, and his best gal play a game on the right. So on the left, I've got a, a simultaneous move game to represent how a president and a congress can interact with each other. The president can send legislation or don't send legislation. And then congress can either accept that or don't accept that. Let's have our payoffs be in utility to make this plenty easy. So a higher number is a better number. All right, this is a common strategic situation in which the president and congress are of opposite parties. You'll see this sort of thing. Uh, you know, I remember when uh, President Obama got elected, not taking a political stance here, but uh, he got elected and the Senate Majority Leader uh, uh, immediately said, whatever we do, we're going to oppose everything he does. Doesn't matter what it is, we're just going to say no. So sometimes uh, politics can be represented game theoretically. So let's say the president wants to send legislation or don't send legislation. Congress can accept or, or don't. What should they do? What motivates this sort of thing to take place um, in which not a lot gets done as far as uh, lots of pieces of legislation? So let's say the president is considering their strategic choices and Congress has accepted. If you're thinking from the president's standpoint, remember you've got a best reply to what your opponent could do. So think through all the strategic ramifications. Let's say they accept, what should we do? If we send legislation as player one, we'd get 100. If we don't send legislation, we get negative 100. So what would we want to do? We would want to send legislation because 100 is better than negative 100. Now if they opposed us, what would we want? We would also want to send legislation because, what? 50 is better than negative 500. If they oppose us, but we send legislation, we get 50. And if we don't send legislation, we get negative 500. 50 is better than negative 500. So the president in this game has a dominant strategy, no matter what Congress does, to be sending legislation, right? Got to at least try and look like you're getting something done. What about Congress, though? Congress goes should be accept or oppose in every strategic possible situation that could arise. So let's say the president sends legislation, and we know he will. It's his dominant strategy. If we accept it, we get negative 500. Our constituents are not pleased. But if we oppose it, we get 100. 100 is better than negative 500, so I draw an arrow or I underline my path. I like to do both sometimes. And if the president doesn't send legislation, and we accept it, we get negative 500. If we 
Suppose that we get 100. That is, we are always better off over here doing what? Saying, nah, no thanks. No thanks at all. That is, Congress has a dominant strategy. No matter what the president's doing to say, we're against that person. So the Nash equilibrium in this game, we get the intersection of, of arrows or the both paths being underlined in this top right box. So the Nash equilibrium, the abbreviated equilibrium, EQ apostrophe M, would be send legislation, oppose legislation. Right, that would be your solution to this player one, player two, the strategies they choose in this game. All right, for this next game, let's assume Dr. Hood and his best gal, that's a you know, 50s term for uh, your uh, partner, girlfriend, whatever. Um, let's say that after work, they're both deciding what they should do. And she never charges her phone, so I can't get in contact with her. I don't know if she's going to meet at, or I mean, Dr. Hood, not me, is trying to decide, should he go to their favorite dinner spot or should he go to home? Let's say the payoffs are as follows. If they both go to dinner, it's 20 utils of happiness, 20 utils of utility for each. If Dr. Hood goes to chill at home and she goes to dinner, they both get zero. If he goes to dinner and she goes to home, they both get zero. Well, again. But if they both chill at home, let's say they both get 10. That is, they're only happy if they're together and they're both real and this isn't sad or made up at all. Right? Right? Anyway, let's say we're trying to think about what Dr. Hood should do. Think about all the strategic possibilities of what his best gal could do. So let's say she goes to dinner. What should we do? If we go to dinner, we get 20. If we chill at home, we get zero. So obviously, strategically, 20 is better than zero for player one. That's what they should do. If she chills at home, he gets zero. If he goes to dinner, the 20 if he chills at home too. So what should he do? He should chill at home. Does Dr. Hood have a dominant strategy? He does not. He should not always do the same thing. It's going to be context dependent. Now, what about her? Should she go to dinner or chill at home? If Dr. Hood goes to dinner, she gets 20 for dinner or zero at home, so she's better off going to dinner. But if he chills at home, she's better off chilling at home because 10 is better than zero, right? What's going on here? We've got two places where the arrows converge on the same box. That means we have two Nash equilibria. So in our curly brackets here, we have dinner, 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 and chill, chill. There are two Nash equilibria. Well, how do we know what happens? Well, you should take ECO 340 so we learn how to solve coordination games and other games with multiple Nash equilibria. Is that a good sales job? I hope so. Anyway, this is oligopoly and game theory. We looked at what oligopolies are and um, how they come to be and how they can be sustained and keep profits going in the long run. And then we looked at game theory and how to solve simultaneous and sequential move games. I hope this was non-terrible. Have a great day.